we would have a panel talk now. So uh, Kumar and Sarah are also on the stage. And I would like to welcome a third person uh, onto this stage uh, who you uh, may or may not have met before. Uh, that would be Christoph van Tomme. Uh, he's here as, um, well, founder of API to Docs and also as a CEO of Pranovis Developer Portals and the one who was hosting um, the metric stack in Paris because you were the one who was leading the panel talks. Is Lucas also in uh, the audience? So we didn't pre-agree because I didn't know if Lucas was coming. Lucas was the other host in uh, the API based track in Paris. And he's um, working. Hi, Lucas. Hey, let's see if we can get you faster on stage than me. <laughs> Uh, so Lucas uh, is uh, specialized in API technical writing and uh, API design. Uh, he also actually wrote a book recently on that. And um, he was hosting the, these talks from a different point of view. Um, there were some questions separate, uh, specifically uh, for Sarah in the meanwhile, why are we are waiting? Uh, but, um, I think it could be asked also from Kumar. Um, first one was, um, what are the ideas to keep developers engaged both in writing and in reading the documentation? And I would ask for Sarah then. <laughs> thank you. Um, and I, I just wanted to thank everyone in chat who's left really kind messages. I tried to react to all of them, but I wasn't able to for some reason. But thank you. I really appreciate it. I wanted to say that. Um, so this is a really good question and one that we've had to think about quite a bit um, in different organizations I've worked with um, over the years. I wanted to say that <clears throat> depending on where you sit in the team you're in, you might have a big enough team that you're able to have um, people like Kumar who help you with um, technical writing as you go along and develop your tool, which is excellent. Um, and sometimes teams are small enough that people are wearing multiple hats, meaning the developer is also the community engagement person, is also the technical writing person. Um, and so there's no harm in assuming that, you know, people are at different levels and might not have the expertise or the confidence to, to drive the documentation work. And that's why sometimes it stalls or is very slow. And so I, I said in writing that it might be a really good place to start to upskill people. Um, I have this book, <laughs> uh, Docs for Developers. It's a really, really good book to go through as a team. Um, it just gives you, um, you know, equal ground in terms of understanding technical documentation and how to approach it for the work that you need to do. And then you approach documentation as a team effort going forwards. Um, so not separating documentation from your API development process, making it a core part of your development process, understanding that documentation starts on the day that you determine that there's need for an API to resolve a need um, and that Eventually, not all the documentation will make it out publicly, but um, all of it will be important for some things. Some of it will be will remain internal, but will inform future decisions about where your API goes and things like that. A lot of it will end up going out together with your API and not delaying it. Um, so documentation should start early on, focus on um, maybe upskilling everyone and then move together make it a team effort. Um, so that means that if we are all upskilled, whatever you write, Laura, um, Christoph is able to review. Uh, whenever Christoph is aware, I'm able to step up and do the work. Um, if there's missing pieces that community members point out, any of us can step in and fix it. It's not one person's responsibility, it's everyone's. So that's the writing bit. Um, and then the reading bit, um, it's okay for people not to read your documentation start to finish, they will likely come and find the information that they need for any given work or that they feel they're struggling with, right? But information architecture has to be done really well, I think, um, so that discovery is easy um, and people are able to find what it is that they need. Um, in addition to that, people have very different learning patterns that you have to pay attention to. 
Um, so providing the same content in multiple formats is so important, right? Um, so it's written there, but if you're able to have visual content instead or a sandboxing environment that sort of allows people to play uh, with the examples you have as they go along um, so that people are able to ingest and understand what it is you're putting out to them in a manner that is most meaningful to them um, and, and go along that way. Um, one thing I mentioned is people like Twilio have found a really good way to make sure people go through their documentation in detail. They have gamified documentation essentially with things like Twilio Quest. So you're learning, but it's it feels fun. You're earning badges as you go along. And um, you know, you learn things from basics of programming. Um, but if you're really good at those, it just means you're going through those levels faster. And if you're a partner, you're able to write in new sections of the gaming experience. Um, so there's always something new for people to learn about the Twilio documentation itself, but also affiliated partner content. So that's also a really good way if you're able to. Um, but yes, same content, multiple formats is a really good way, I will say. Mm -hmm. Do you disagree or want to add something to that, Kumar? No, I have 100 or 150% to everything that uh, there is that I think she covered most of what I had in mind as well. Mm -hmm. um, so great question, uh, Anna. And I think this this question alone can take an entire session. Um, so I'm, I'm just reading through the, I'm reading through the question very carefully, right? So ideas for keeping developers engaged, right? So there are internal developers within your company and then external developers. And then we're talking about keeping both of these groups uh, engaged in, in, in content development and in consumption. Um, so on, on the development side, just like Sarah said, right? So there's um, a couple of things I'd like to add um, is if it helps to provide uh, the community a way to contribute content, right? So if you, if you have a community sub-site or a micro-site within your portal, um, maybe you can encourage folks to write blogs there and, um, and publish those blogs on your site instead of having them go and publish articles on Medium and other places, which is also good. Um, and even if they do that, if they do it on third party sites, it's a good way to uh, link to those to that content if you can from, from your internal blog and so on. And give, give developers the recognition that they deserve. Right? I think Sarah touched upon this a little earlier. So everybody likes to be recognized and to be rewarded. Um, so you know, make sure that we give folks badges, for example, if they contribute on community discussion forums or they write articles. Um, you know, ask if they're okay with having their names and their their even their pictures displayed or even their profiles, right? So that you know they get more to you know, participate more in the content development uh, activity. Another idea is to include uh, external and internal developers in, in the review process for content development, right? So the more people you include in the review process, the more engaged they feel in the content uh, development activity as a, as a whole. And so those are a few ideas besides what Sarah said on the, on the content development side. On the consumption side, um, technical documentation is definitely not bedtime reading, right? So um, as, as Sarah was saying, we definitely cannot expect folks to read content end to end and or even read content ever, right? Uh, but a few things that stood out uh, for me from you know, what we've done in, in, in my company and other places is try to integrate um, the experience with hands-on learning, right? So if you can provide a way to display documentation side by side with uh, a way to explore uh, the, right? So if you have, for example, an API explorer, which folks can use to try out the API methods while they're reading the API content, then that's an interactive way to keep folks within your documentation site, um, even when they want to try things out. And then, like Sarah said, uh, recognize that there are multiple uh, learning patterns that folks have and try and deliver content that meets customers where they are. This now, this can be expensive given the current economic situation. Budgets are you know, something that's top of mind for everybody. So it's difficult to convince management that you need money to do uh, documentation in multiple formats or videos and so on. 
uh, but it's, it's a good, um, you know, it, it's a good way to do it when you have the money. Uh, visuals definitely help keep, keep uh, readers engaged. Another thing I'd like to suggest is to try and localize your content to as many uh, locales as you can. Um, English is widely uh, used as a common language, uh, but there are folks, a lot of technical folks out there who still consume content in their own different languages, right? So uh, localization helps you meet the audience where they are. And then, um, like Sarah was saying with Spotify, there are opportunities to provide feedback channels within your content so that folks can provide comments directly at the bottom of a page, for example, and keep a discussion going instead of just treating the feedback as an offline kind of process. So those are some thoughts I had. Um, I hope that I'm done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Krista, did this question come up also in the panel talks? Um, well, the, the panel talks was was, um, was very much an unconference. Uh, so uh, the, for backgrounds, um, because of circumstances, like some slots came came free. So what we decided was to sit together and and um, have like an ad hoc conversation about uh, metrics and analytics and like and how how do you get feedback on your documentation. Uh, I think it was um, what I learned from it was that. Um, people definitely are looking for more information about it. I think it's, uh, Komar was also hinting at it, that the, the economical climate today uh, has us all very much focused on how we're contributing to the bottom line. And, um, and I think that that's probably why uh, feedbacks and metrics are, are more than ever uh, center of thought. Um, so I think, I think that's, yeah. yeah. But it, it was more of a surface discussion, I would say. Mm -hmm. kind of like how do you get started with it mm -hmm. uh, i think one one thing that i wanted to add and, and actually ask from from what sarah and kumar is um uh, and this this is not necessarily based on the api the docs uh, track that we had at api 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 days but on the devrel conference uh, panel discussion we had about developer success because i saw sarah that you had that also in your slides in one of the the graphics is this um like how how do you your your acts of measuring like your feedback mechanisms your metrics mechanisms how do they help you to focus on the things that help you know make your management happy and and um uh, because i think i think that that kumar you were pointing out that this metrics is complex uh, you might be measuring something and the number might mean one thing in this case and another thing in another case um it, like, do you, do you have any practices that you've you've set up to um, to show, like, you know, this is how uh, the things that we're doing are contributing to uh, the overall success of the business, or even to the bottom line, if if possible? Um, it, do, do you have a, do you have any experience with like making it like super? Oh, how to say, like going from the yes, our program is succeeding to we're moving the bottom line. Do you, have, yeah. do you have experience with that? Uh, not a whole lot of experience, but I, from observation, I've um, learned a few things over the years that um, businesses care about money, end of the day, right? Uh, I think you, you alluded to that. Uh, you said you were talking about bottom line. So ideally, uh, I think our management would like us to demonstrate how whatever we are all doing in developer experience or developer relations is helping bring us more, bring in more money um, or, you know, improve the bottom line somehow, maybe by reducing the cost and so on. Um, so I would start any analytics exploration with you know, those two top level items in mind. If we can bring, if we can measure how our content is bringing in more users to explore and adopt our product, and if our content is helping reduce um, cost. So cost could be on two fronts, right? It could be cost of developers who are trying to, uh, the, the friction that developers experience when they are trying to adopt our product, uh, which leads to support costs and so on. And the friction that happens after developers have adopted our products, which again leads to support costs or even lost revenue in some cases. Um, significant uh, in in the case of web-based products like cloud services, 
um, it's kind of a little easy because you have metrics that you have um, for both the product and for the content that you can correlate using, for example, user IDs and so on. Uh, but in the case of um, products that are delivered offline, uh, you know, devices, for example, it's pretty hard to, to use analytics to correlate uh, content with revenue and bottom line. Right, but uh, at least in the case of web-based uh, products, um, it, it can be easier to try and integrate the metrics that you have for your content with how uh, the traffic is moving from your content to uh, the products and services online. Right, so if that if that developer engagement uh, flow is established, then you have this metric called active developers, right, which are developers who are moving from your content to your product and, and you know, back and forth. Uh, so that might that might be a useful uh, set of data to explore, keeping in mind the, the top level uh, requirement for management, that is that they want to see how our content is, is driving revenue and reducing cost. Uh, I know these were kind of very broad ideas, but um, that's, that's what it comes to mind at the moment. Thank, thank you. And for, for you, Sarah, because you're in the archetypical ecosystem building function, right? Because I, I think that your your job really is about growing the Spotify ecosystem, where it's even more indirect. And and like, do do you have do you have any um, advice for other companies that have similar API programs? Because a lot of API programs are not directly contributing to bottom line. They're also very like a complementary product to some sort of other service that that the company is actually making money on. Um, do you have any advice on what, what your team has, has been looking at um, or any ideas that people yeah. could consider? Yeah, um, I, I, I like this question because it's one of the genuinely difficult ones um, on an every on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis at work. Um, there's no easy answer for, you know, show me impact and um, show how this impact will continue on for a week to come, a month to come, a year to come. Um, but one of the most important things we have learned is it is important to set expectations about why um, the developer experience outfit um, exists and it exists for the community first and foremost. Um, so one of the things we've been able to draw from and we've been very lucky to be able to draw from is this community that set up and grew organically over the years and the kind of work they've been able to put out and the impact that has had on you know, the numbers that we see um, or Spotify users in the end because sometimes people will buy into Spotify because this hyper-specific experience in Nakuru, which is a town I was born in in Kenya, um, speaks to them in a way that, you know, maybe Spotify in general didn't seem to, and then they become a part of Spotify. Mm -hmm. And so being able to package those stories over time and tell those um, stories carefully, not just so that other developers are inspired by them, but also so that um, the engineering teams internally that that worked on these APIs eons ago or are working on an iteration of version of it right now can see the impact of the work that they did, the decisions they made years ago, and can buy into the idea that it continues to make a difference in the real world. I think we are also lucky in the sense that Spotify enhances or improves people's lives or affects people's lives positively for the most part. And so this these stories are quite significant when we find them and are able to tell them. And so we capitalize on that. We're also very careful to just talk about the value of qualitative data, which is what we primarily focus on. And that takes time. Um, you know, and setting that expectation ahead of time, but also showing how we are working incrementally to a place where we're able to give you your answers and delivering on previous promises made um, has been a really good way to go. Um, so I love that Kumar made the distinction that um, quantitative data is not everything and it can be misinterpreted for the most part. Um, and so 
prioritizing qualitative data and you know getting into the weeds of it and understanding how you can use it for your product in some cases works in our case has been able to work so yeah. so ba basically it's really important to capture the metrics you can but then you have to turn it into stories so that you can uh, keep explaining why you're relevant and why the work that you're doing is important uh, exactly yeah. So or why you need to recalibrate, right? Um, because at the core of this, we are here for the users, as I said, for the developer community, and we have to be able to advocate for the direction that we are suggesting we take, right? Um, and so a lot of this depends on the anecdotal information. For example, um, a very easy one. Um, if one person asks a question about a section of the one of the APIs, then maybe you answer them in the forum. If three people are asking you the same question in a short span of time, that definitely means something is missing in documentation and you can either go back and, and advocate for that to be changed or change it yourself, right, if possible. But you're able to make a distinct case for why a thing has to be done a certain way. And this can be expanded into the more complex situations, which you see every day in the forum. So there's really great value in being where the community is, actively listening, and then finding the patterns in the conversations that are happening and using those to structure the stories in a way that is relevant to your business case themes that people are most focused on internally so that they see value in where you're focusing your energies as a team. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have follow-up questions, but I first want to give a chance. <laughs> I don't, I, I would like to ask if you have um, mm, anecdotes or specific examples uh, where a qualitative feedback gathering and analytical analytics of measured user behavior measurement, as in um, web analytics, feed each other or influence each other. So. What do you measure? Why do you measure? What do you ask? Why do you ask? And how do they play together? Both, both lead you into the weeds. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> actually, you I'm, I have an example of the opposite case where uh, we actually got contradictory signals from data metrics and uh, you know, analytics. But if, if Sarah has something that directly addresses your question, I'd like to go first. Um, yes, I have one. I think it's very straightforward. It's going to be short. Um, so one of the things that has happened over the years is, you know, before you put out an API, um, you document it, of course. Um, and a lot of the times um, in, in the past, we will find documentation written from the perspective of the team that would want it used elsewhere, right? And some of the problems we found um, by looking at our metrics was that some of those pages had really in-depth information but almost zero you know like very few page visits and and so the question becomes why are the pages where you're spending the most amount of time are developing with the developer in mind why are those receiving the least amount of traction right and so recalibrating means talking to the developers this is meant for and finding out why is it because the self serve experience um you know just those are bits they are able to figure out the api on their own without going into those pages is it because they can't discover them so you need to improve discoverability um you know is it all the reasons and so you you know, in the end, it leads you back to uh, best practices, like API fast um, approaches to things, which requests or demands that you center people fast and ask them about their needs early on, and then keep checking with them as you build stuff, uh, design your API, develop it, um, document it, um, so that by the time you're putting out things um, and your information architecture is set up, it already has these people in mind and their workflows um, and the ways in which they will interact with your documentation. Sometimes the answer is as, as easy as it wasn't linked from anywhere. Some people didn't even know to find it. It's there, but it's not 
linked from anywhere. But um, that's a really straightforward example of where, you know, metrics have then informed some of the qualitative um, data we've had to collect from community members and recalibrate. And it always works um, to have them, it to depend on them um, on uh, quantitative and qualitative data in that way. So kind of the absence of expected behavior should trigger questions. Um, well, I, I will say maybe learn the first time and then <laughs> change the way you are called together and then monitor the difference and you still people aren't coming to it, then maybe there's a bigger problem around um, how your portal is set up or I don't know, um, you need to rethink the bigger questions outside just the information architecture you have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the counter intuitive example, Kumar? Yeah, so this one I'm hoping I can keep it short. Um, so a few years back in another job, um, we were looking at decommissioning some content, right? So removing content from our website because we didn't, we wanted to rationalize um, our effort and invest only in the content that we thought was, was useful. Uh, so obviously, um, one of the first things we did is we turned to metrics to help us decide which pages are uh, most often consumed and most popular. And so we landed out with a bunch of um, hundreds of pages, which we found to be either with zero or very low page views. And um, and so we were going through that list and trying to figure out uh, which ones really need, uh, can be safely decommissioned. And and by, we realized that uh, some of these pages were about uh, were for content that was about um, product that was getting us a lot of revenue, uh, and the product was fairly complex. So it was kind of counterintuitive to look at uh, a, a content page that was about a complex revenue earning product, um, but the page was not getting a lot of um, views. So we started the conversation with the product management team, and it turns out that these uh, this product was was a revenue generating product that was used by just one big customer, and who happened to be contributing about twenty five percent of the revenue for that product. And the there was one architect in that um, company who was using our product, who was, who he and his team, uh, three or four people were the only ones reading that content, but they were making all the decisions about you know, which service to, services to use, which components to buy and so on. Um, so those folks were using the content. So the, just the raw analytics would have led us to believe that that page was not highly popular and consumed. But a conversation with the product management you know, helped us understand that uh, there, there was there usage and that usage was the most critical for us for that product, right? So we decided in the end to keep those uh, pages and continue investing in them. But this is an example of how, how misleading uh, metrics can be. And um, I think like Christophe was saying, we need to tell managers, management a story about activities but constantly remind ourselves and our audience management that data can be manipulated or data can be misunderstood. Um, right, so just be aware of that, that pitfall and that contradiction. Krista, did you hear um, surprising examples around the numbers telling a different story than what you see, for example, in revenue or in behavior? I personally, I don't, I'm not too close to the, to the actual mm -hmm. metrics and analytics. It's more, uh, I, I, I meet a lot of people that need to somehow prove that what they're doing is valuable and that, uh, that are like looking for ways to, um, to improve the value that they're creating for their organizations. And, uh, so I'm a little bit more on the, on the more abstract level. Um, the, it's, in, it's very interesting what you were saying, Kumar, that it's, basically data is just a signal but what it means can be something completely different <laughs> so it's just a oh something interesting happened uh, well what does it mean <laughs> that's really 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 exciting yeah uh, um, you, you just, oh sorry i was saying we can say whatever story we want to using data but um so the, the risk with data is that sometimes we start with the hypothesis and we try to use data to 
So we try and the, we try and shape data to fit that hypothesis, which is very dangerous, um, right? So uh, that, that's a risk that over the years I've um, the more I learn about analytics, the less I'm comfortable about using analytics uh, entirely just uh, for my decision making. There was a question about email marketing at Spotify, and I wonder if Sarah, you could answer that in a private, uh, because um, that would lead us to a very, very deep bunny hole, I think. Uh, also, it might be a little too company sensitive specific information. I don't know. Yeah, um, I I left written text in there. Um, okay. If anyone is interested in reading. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The other question was, where would you start backfiling API reference documentation in a company that hasn't previously invested time in technical writing? And I would like to open that up a little bit. Um, how do you interrogate your metrics um, and the data you get? on the absence of things. So for example, uh, Kumar brought up, be very careful with bounce rate because it can mean either it wasn't there or that it actually was there. And uh, when you have uh, specifically um, guiding documentation and that can be quickly read and get done or not, obviously you could go to support and ask what are the questions being asked because they can't find it. Is there any other option that you would see? Where would you start adding information if you cannot measure the visit rate because it isn't there? So, so just so I understand what you're asking, Lana, so you're talking about a use case where the product is sold and being used, but there is no content. Or missing pieces, or you know, it can always get better. All right. I'm imagining that in such a case, if the product is being used and being uh, purchased, um, and there is missing content, folks will complain, right? Um, so the support, I guess the support metrics would be a point to start looking at opportunities to add value um, through content. So if our support team is getting a lot of load and they're unable to efficiently uh, you know, turn around the cases and solve customer problems, then that might be a starting point to look for areas where we can start investing our limited resources. Yeah, um, in some cases, I would say um, if you had multiple versions of your API and somehow not gotten around to documenting or putting out technical docs on any of them yet, um, looking at your metrics to see who's using what version the most um, and then starting by prioritizing the one that has the most use um, and then working your way down to other versions might be helpful um, for, you know, as, as a matter of agency for your community and then working your way back. Um, yeah, I would say. Let me see if Lucas is chiming in on this. Okay. So um, there's, I assume, some answers to this in the books that you recommended, and I thank you very much for your recommendations. Um, what is, um, let me ponder on this absence of things. What is the question that you were hoping to be asked here when we're talking about metrics and analytics, and you're nobody's asking it. I was hoping to uh, hear someone explain uh, a wonderful success story where they use metrics and they saved the company uh, you know, X million dollars or got so many million dollars of revenue. So I was hoping someone from the panel or from the audience can share that. <laughs> it might still come maybe somebody i don't millions is a big ask <laughs> so maybe maybe like uh yeah the, the reason i ask is in, in some of my previous jobs we've actually made claims that some of our content led to x you know whatever million or thousand uh thousand, thousand worth of business 
uh, but then it is almost always a stretch uh, to kind of make some assumptions about how uh, you know the the correlation led to causation, and, and there is a big risk with that. Right? So I'm I'm looking for I'm still trying to find out concrete examples where someone said I landed this deal just because of content. Right? So there's that still evidence is what I'm looking for. Uh, Laura Novice is writing uh, that uh, we have a metric date ca uh, track for case resolution to see how much money was saved because customers found information and didn't open a ticket. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. If you could do that, Laura. Thanks for sharing that. So I think partially depends uh, because we were. It's API the docs, which is also about developer portals and not only about cont pure content. Yeah. Um, like there's, uh, I, we have seen stories with some of our customers where um, uh, creating self self service uh, or uh, capturing information that otherwise you have to ask in like uh, support questions that that like cuts down on the number of supports um, back and forward that has to happen before you can get access to an API. And those those kind of things can save a lot of money if if you have a, a big big number of people uh, requesting access. Uh, one customer was talking about uh, uh, like a whole well a whole support team that was able to be reassigned to something else uh, because now they had self service uh, for some of their APIs. Um, so that 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 could get to the millions maybe, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah. yeah. But I don't, I don't have like a hard ROI. These are the actual numbers story. I'm, I'm still asking for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sarah, <laughs> do you have that kind of success story? I don't have concrete examples in mind, um, but when I do, I'll likely write about them or ask you to invite me to another podcast to talk about. <laughs> From the podcasts, um, and this is also personal, I think one of the things it's very, very hard to measure and put financial data to is the cost of attention of colleagues. And I saw in the audience, uh, I hope she's still here, um, Mira Balani, uh, Myra Balani. She works as a technical writer at uh, Myro. And we had an interview with her, um, her colleagues, uh, Anthony Ru, uh, who is in developer relations, and uh, Marco Spinello. And they were talking about uh, a ginormous effort that their team has put into and, and rolling out of consolidating feedback gathering and then how they roll it back into the company. So instead of, uh, you know, the usual, everybody following a billion Slack channels and somehow maybe remembering the feedback that here or there came in from customers from here and there from support and then uh, team meetings, it comes up or maybe have a more organized way. And how do you pull that into one space and then channel it to the right people that they hear it right? Um, and that it's hard to measure it but it should end up in less eyes for less time on the same messaging or the right eyes on the message that they otherwise wouldn't have seen. Mm, and in the meantime, there was the books uh, recommendations uh, being recalled. So um, we're a little bit over time. So uh, let me start closing. Uh, for that, we have slides. And uh, in that, I will also start mentioning of the publication of your slides and there the book recommendations will come up. Uh, but for those who you think are impatient, please feel free, uh, both Sarah and Kumar, to, to type it in the chat here. And thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Kumar, for coming. Uh, very, very honored. Uh, I'm super nervous, but I hope that we could uh, tease out what you had in mind uh, for today. And I'm looking forward to our future conversations.